Hello and welcome to Justice. I'm Janine Pirro. Thanks for being with us tonight. And thanks to all of you for once again making Justice number one last weekend. We have a big show on deck with Kellyanne Conway, Mark Levin, Michelle Malkin, and Mike Huckabee coming up. But first, my open. You know, I've had a change of heart. Unlike everyone on the right, I don't want the Mueller investigation to end so soon. I want it to keep going on and on and on. Because every day it gets closer to proving Russia collusion. The collusion, however, with Russia and Team Obama, not Trump. Whether it's Hillary's reset button, the sale of 20% of our uranium to Russia with a $145 million payback to the Clinton Foundation, or the fact that the Obama administration watched as Russia annexed Crimea and then invaded Ukraine, while Barack Obama whispered in that off-mic moment, quote, tell Vlad I'll have more leeway after or flexibility after the election, or whether you even believe Barack told Putin when he became aware of Russia's attempt to meddle, to knock it off. Or when Obama weaponized the intelligence community to unmask Trump people like Michael Flynn, Carter Page, and others. The truth is every day we get to watch the evidence of the framing of Donald Trump exposed. This week, The Hill's John Solomon broke yet another explosive story of anti-Trump conspiracy. Now, we all know Hillary Clinton and the DNC gave millions to an opposition research firm, Fusion GPS, that then hired Christopher Steele to create dirt on Donald Trump in order to surveil his campaign. To this day, we still haven't heard why a FISA court judge would even consider signing a surveillance warrant based upon this fraudulent document. But what no one seems to be talking about is that this same dossier is the basis of the Mueller investigation itself. Right after his election, mind you, after Donald Trump's win, the head of Fusion GPS meets with a top Justice Department official, Bruce Orr. Two days later, Orr, Rod Rosenstein's right hand, takes the information from Fusion back to the DOJ and gives it to the FBI, setting off the beginning of the Mueller investigation. Now, a Russia collusion criminal investigation. Christopher Steele, of course, terminated by the FBI for leaking information to the media. Yet, even after the election and his dismissal, he continues to meet and speak with Bruce Orr, who takes this information from a source he is not allowed to work with, or then launders it, feeds it to justice and the FBI, and then he amazingly tries to get the discredited Steele back into the FBI as a human source. So why would Orr, after back-channeling information with Steele, a fired FBI human source, work so hard to get Steele back into the FBI? Think about the timing. There's only one reason Steele is the one person who supports the inaccurate, unverified dossier. Even Comey said it was unverified. But in order to get the Department of Justice and FBI interested in a new criminal Trump-Russia collusion investigation, it was essential that Steele be back in their good graces. And by the way, if you think Peter Strzok and Lisa Page hated Donald Trump, folks, meet Christopher Steele a discredited FBI source trying desperately to get on Mueller's destroyed Trump team. Peter Strzok, another Trump hater, although he admits there was no there there, also seeks and gets on the Mueller team. So, Team Mueller, have on it. The more you investigate, procrastinate, and fail to find evidence of Trump Russia collusion, the more you become hoisted by your own petard. But Bob, my questions to you, 
How could you possibly be investigating Donald Trump when there is absolutely no credible basis for your investigation? And what the hell have you and your Trump-hating, conflicted team of prosecutors come up with in the last 19 months other than a tax evasion case that doesn't involve Donald Trump, Russia, or collusion of any sort and should be prosecuted by a regular U.S. attorney's office and not you? But more important, Bob, is what you're hiding and protecting as you continue with your fraudulent investigation. Permit me. In 2009, a Russian oligarch named Deripaska was asked by the FBI to give millions of his own money to fund an FBI operation. The man running the FBI, Bob? You. The man courting the Russian oligarch for money was Andrew McCabe, deputy director of the FBI, now since fired. Now, Bob, in spite of the fact that Deripaska had been banished by the United States three years earlier in 2006 because of his organized crime affiliations, your FBI asks him to fund one of your operations? But more important, after Donald Trump is elected, Deripaska is asked by the FBI to help corroborate the Steele dossier? Deripaska himself scoffed at the idea that Trump colluded with Russia. Quote, you're trying to create something out of nothing. Fast forward nine years later, and you indict Paul Manafort. But one name is left out of that indictment. Bob, your indictment makes no mention of Deripaska, even though you had evidence that Manafort wanted to invite him to a Trump campaign briefing. So my question to you, Bob Mueller, would be as follows. Are you using the Christopher Steele fake dossier as the basis of your investigation? What crime are you investigating? Did you know Bruce Orr and Christopher Steele communicated directly, although surreptitiously, after Steele was fired? Was Bruce Orr working with you, getting information to you? And of course... You know Bruce's wife, Nellie, was getting paid for and working for Fusion GPS. Have you investigated that conflict? And speaking of wives making money off their husbands in DOJ and FBI, have you investigated Andrew McCabe's wife for the money she took from the Clinton-connected McAuliffe for her campaign? Which money she could keep if she didn't spend them? And why did you give a special security clearance to Peter Strzok, allowing him to declassify information? Why did it take us four months to find out why you fired Peter Strzok? Why would you ask for millions of dollars from a Russian oligarch banned from the United States to fund an FBI operation? Should you even have asked the oligarch for tens of millions of dollars and for his services? Because that's a crime, isn't it, Bob? I'm sure you know the Anti-Deficiency Act prohibits you as a government agency from accepting voluntary services. And if it came out that you took money, Bob, from a Russian oligarch whose name you intentionally left out of Manafort's indictment, that would be an embarrassment, wouldn't it? Isn't that why you never put his name in the Manafort indictment? And by the way... Isn't this a classic conflict of interest? And when Deripaska laughed at the idea of Trump collusion with Russia, was that exculpatory information conveyed to the FISA court? Aren't you worried that your prior actions with Deripaska are worthy of its own grand jury investigation? And speaking of the FISA court, isn't your whole investigation premised on a fake dossier? paid for by Hillary, created by a man who hates Donald Trump, and used to con a FISA court judge? Bob, I really think it's time for you to give up your phony investigation and get yourself your own criminal defense attorney. And that's my open. If you love my opening statements, you're going to love my new book, number one New York Times bestseller, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, The Case Against the Anti-Trump Conspiracy.
And joining me now with reaction to my open and all the developing news this week, Counselor to the President Kellyanne Conway. Uh, Kellyanne, good evening. It's nice to have Hi. you on set tonight. It's a pleasure. Well, you're usually in Washington. I've it's good to have you in, in town. In eight months. Yeah, and we're not even in our new studio anymore. But. We're, we're thrilled to have you here. I want to ask you a question. Uh, the president tweeted today that um, the big story that the fake news media refuses to report is low life Christopher Steele's many meeting with uh, Deputy AG Bruce Orr and his beautiful wife Nellie. And he talks about the Department of Justice and the fact that the Department of Justice is not giving Andrew uh, McCabe text messages to Judicial Watch or the appropriate government agencies. And the FBI, he says, won't even give one. Uh, I, have, I may have to get involved. What are they hiding? McCabe's wife took big campaign dollars. Okay, what the president's saying is, why isn't the FBI giving this information to Congress and to Judicial Watch? Janine, I don't want the public to think that this is normal or necessary, all of this conduct, meaning that you have people very high up in President Obama's FBI, even after President Trump is elected, unexpectedly and undesirably by those folks in the FBI. We don't want people to think that this is that everybody in Washington does this. Everybody in Washington doesn't do this. In fact, the only dirt as the winning campaign manager I researched for Hillary Clinton was five foot two, eyes of blue, oh, what corruption she would say and do. It was all right there in Hillary Clinton. Never looked outside of her statements, her lies, the problem that she had with the truth, the problem the public had with okay, her. But, but the problem that the but president I'm make, is but I'm making the Right, but I'm well, making yeah. the point. I want to make the point very emphatically mm -hmm. that if you're investigating Russia collusion and somehow people playing dirty pool in the Trump campaign to help him get elected. That simply did not happen on my watch. I was out there every day on the TV saying what our strategy was. The president, most importantly, our best asset and the vice president, our second best asset out there every single day connecting with people directly and promising them to do everything they're doing now which okay, is cut but taxes. this is my question so the president is the frustrated qu he wants to know why we're not investigating why those isn't who the were FBI giving the Andrew McCabe text messages to judicial watch or the appropriate government authority congress is trying to do its oversight right. it tells me if he's doing a tweet like that, he doesn't have confidence in Christopher Ray. Neither do I, to be honest with you. Christopher Ray, from day one, and I don't know who made these recommendations, but from day one, he danced with Congress. Well, that isn't what he's saying. The president's not saying that. In fact, the president directed the FBI director last week to go in front of the brief in the briefing room and tell the country along with the Secretary of Homeland Security and Ambassador to Bolton and others what this administration is doing with respect to cybersecurity, election security, a heck of a lot more than the last administration did. So I'm not going to go there, but I will tell you the president's frustration is one that's shared by many Americans, uh, Judge Janine, because people just want to make sure that all sides of this are being investigated. And I would note that since the Department of Justice and the FBI started to turn over more of these emails and more of these unredacted documents, I suppose, at a swifter pace, look at everything that's come out. No, Every no. Judicial Watch is the one who's sure, getting them because request, they're right. suing. That's well, my point. And the president knows it, which is why he yes. tweeted the big story right. is that why isn't the FBI giving the information? The president is tweeting that. It's not about what's come well, out. Well, the president who I spoke to, to this week several times, was with um, uh, two short days ago, and we uh, discussed some of this. He is very pleased that more information is coming out, that you can now connect more dots between these people who were trying all these shenanigans even after he was elected, always trying to nullify a Democrat, democratically elected president. But I agree with you, too. As this investigation goes on, let's make sure the losers are investigated also because what people are saying right now is why are they still talking about 2016? Why can't they get over it? Because you're still talking about 2016. We know he was democratically elected. We know nobody was colluding and it changed a single vote. In fact, when the Deputy Attorney General announced last month, Janine, 12 indictments against Russians, he made very clear that there's no evidence a single vote was changed and this affected the electoral well, We outcome. know that, but the point is that there is corruption. Look, you're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, judge. When there's corruption, there needs to be consequences. There's no reason to move on.
people need That's to right. be prosecuted right. for and what they've done. And look what's going on in the matter for trial. The matter for trial. No Russia, no Trump, no collusion. No the I president agree. said, that, excuse me, the judge said that that doesn't stop everybody on TV and in print saying, this is who Paul Manafort was, this is who Rick Gates was. Right. No Trump, no Russia, no collusion in that court. We agree. Kellyanne Conway, thanks so much for being with us tonight. And now for more insight into this Mueller witch hunt, there's no one better to ask than the host of Life, Liberty, and Levin right here on Fox News. The one and only Mark Levin. Take a look. Mark, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Uh, we're delighted to have you on Justice for the first time. Um, let's go right to the uh, right to the quick here. Under the Constitution, you say that the president uh, cannot be indicted. So, what is the point of all that's been going on with Mueller and his team? First of all, it's an honor to be with you. You're a great lawyer. Thank you. A um, couple of things here on the constitutional level. Uh, no, Mueller cannot on his own indict a sitting president, and I've talked about this for 18 months, so now even the professors who show up on Fox comprehend what I'm talking about. That's the position of the Department of Justice in their two memos. It's always been their position. So the question is now, can they subpoena the president? Well, they can subpoena whomever they want. The issue is, how does the president respond to a subpoena? And the president should respond to the subpoena depending on what the subpoena says. If the subpoena seeks information from the president, either in person or otherwise, that raises questions about presidential prerogatives, he must not reply. A prosecutor appointed by a deputy attorney general as acting attorney general and is a subordinate to the president doesn't get to question the president's prerogatives and the president exercising those prerogatives. And that's why that cannot be obstruction of justice. Judge, think for a second. If the opposite were the case, then a president can be hit time and time and time again with threats of, of charges against him for obstruction because he fires somebody. So you would have an FBI director who could theoretically, politically blackmail the president of the United States if he even thinks about firing him, or a CIA director, anybody of the sort. Well, I believe that that's already going on because Jim Comey was the head of the FBI. If, if there was a problem, he could have started an investigation. He gets fired and then decides he needs to leak and get an investigation, get things out in the public square. But if, if Mueller were to subpoena, to what end is the subpoena? To no end. Mueller has nothing and he wants to get something. He thinks uh, the he... president is Martha Stewart. She's not, he's not Martha Stewart. He's president of the United States. Now, I want to make this clear. Mr. Mueller is nothing but a single prosecutor. We have thousands of prosecutors in this country. We have one president of the United States. He ran against 16 or 17 other Republicans in primaries. People came out in various states and voted for him. He participated in debates. He participated in the electoral process. He went through the general election. He won the general election. The American people knew who they were voting for. He won fair and square through our Constitution. You cannot have a single prosecutor accountable to no one, elected by nobody, exactly. having the power to take down a sitting president of the United States. Okay, That's but it's the bottom line. It's even worse than that. With all due respect, what they're looking at are the actions that President Trump took while he was in office. Given you cannot indict a president, and given that they're looking at things he did as president, that means that every time the opposing party feels like it, if they can get somebody in the Justice Department to say, we need to investigate the president for doing this, I mean, it's nonsense. There's no end. You subpoena what for? So that they can create an impeachment document? This is lunacy. Should the president fire Mueller? Well, I wouldn't fire him right now. I mean, I think he has Mueller on the ropes, believe it or not. The president Why? wraps himself in his constitutional prerogatives, and he dukes it out. And the fact is that Mr. Mueller shouldn't be issuing any subpoenas. If he really wants questions answered by the president to fill gaps in his massive investigation of nothing, uh, then that's one thing. But he doesn't have that. So what we have here, which is different than every other case that a president's been involved in, as far as I know, we have this broad effort to ask broad questions to try and catch a president that, that may disagree with one of the 450,000 witnesses that Mr. Mueller's already interviewed. That's not how this works. That's not how it's ever worked in the past. They're supposed to be right. very, very narrow, related to some conduct of the president of the United States. There's right. been no conduct of the President of the United States that merits any criminal investigation. Do you want to know how I know that, Judge? 
because when Mr. Mueller was appointed, there was no criminal statute that was cited right. by Mr. Rosenstein in his appointment in the first place. Well, you know, Rosenstein is another one that apparently there were some members of Congress wanted to impeach. Paul Ryan leadership wouldn't let them uh, go forward with it. I mean, it's almost as though the establishment is in line uh, with the Democrats based on a false dossier paid for by Hillary Clinton. She's at the genesis of all of this. But let me ask you this. You and I both know that the president and we both know he does want to talk and it's every lawyer around him who's saying that this shouldn't be done not just because we want you to or we don't but constitutionally it shouldn't be done what do you think the president's base wants here i think his political base uh, wants the president of the united states to fire everybody <laughs> but he better not do that uh, Why? because i think that will, because Every Democrat in the House and a third of the Republicans in the Senate will vote to impeach him. What's the point of that? When I think he can win it, duking it out uh, through the system. Now, if it comes to the point where he needs to fire people, then by God, he has the right to fire people. Of course. But we're talking about the political outcome. So I don't think it's wise for the President of the United States to start firing all these people. There may be a time for that, by the way. Outrage tonight after a chilling threat against ICE agents was discovered. A 33-year-old Massachusetts man was arrested this week in connection with tweeting a murder-for-hire solicitation to kill ICE agents for $500. Here with reaction to this and more, CRTV host Michelle Malkin. All right, good evening, Michelle. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, we talked about uh, on the show uh, Michelle Wolf and their, you know, her parody uh, on Netflix. It's popular nowadays to say ice is bad but there's no better representation of American values right now than ice uh, and as an equal opportunity employer we accept all levels of experience from low to very low and those diagnosed with anger issues so it was funny then but now we've got people actually trying to get individuals to kill ice agents uh, murder for hire yeah, there's a climate of hate in this country, and it stems from the radical left and the anti-Trump resistance, Judge. And, you know, we've had for a long time now, decades, a war on cops. We had a war on the Border Patrol, and now we have a war on rank-and-file ICE agents. All of these law enforcement and immigration enforcement officials have dedicated their lives to defending this country, and we have an out-of-control, run-amuck Democratic Party that now wants to win the midterms by calling on abolishing ICE. And that is, as we can see, an incitement to violence. When you marry this domestic call now that is going out across the country with the official calls by MS-13, which have happened over the last several months and years now for green lighting. Um, and everybody in law enforcement knows exactly what I'm talking about. These are assassination hit orders right. that are being issued by MS-13 East Coast gang leaders. And what we know, Judge, and something right. I've oh. been warning about for years is, okay. is that this is not just a border problem. It is a national, it is a national problem, problem from okay. coast to coast. But, but, Michelle, here's the problem. When you have a United States senator like Kirsten Gillibrand and the, the woman who's running for governor in New York out there saying abolishing ICE should be a top priority uh, when the Dems flip the House and the Senate, you know, how do we deal with that? Isn't that like, uh, that's anarchy by people we're electing. It absolutely is, and that's why I'm telling everybody that will listen uh, that they have the power at the ballot box to make a difference. These midterms and the 2020 election stem and are revolving on a fundamental question. Do you support immigration anarchy or do you oppose it? And will you get to that ballot box and not only oppose the radical progressives who believe in the open borders agenda and undermining our public safety, our national sovereignty, and our economic self-determination, but will you also oppose those big business chamber of commerce forces that are every bit as opposed to, to Donald Trump as the radical left. Well, Michelle, uh, it's going to be an interesting midterm. Michelle Malkin, thanks so much for, be, for being with us tonight. You bet. All right, coming up, the second part of my interview with Mark Levin, and he takes on the liberals. But first, Chris Hahn, David Avella are ready to square off in tonight's all-star panel next.
Welcome back to Justice. Let's get right to it with my panel tonight. GOPAC Chairman David Avella, former aide to Chuck Schumer, radio show host Chris Hahn. All right, guys. Uh, you know, we were just talking about uh, ICE and the abolition of ICE and, and how at first it was a joke with Michelle Wolf, and then now there's people actually offering money for uh, to have ICE agents killed. I just, during the break, I just did a quick count. There are about 35 uh, Democrats in Congress who support the abolition of ICE. 133 Democrats wouldn't take a position on a resolution. So, uh, Chris Hahn, do you think that's a winning position for the Democrats uh, in the midterms? The Democrats don't want to eliminate border security. They might want to change ICE. They might want to redo no, the they priorities want to abolish of ICE. From ICE. Separating. No, no, no. They might want to change ICE, and they might want to change the way we, we, we work at our borders so that we're not, a limp, we're not separating children from their mothers as they cry ICE when they're seeking that. asylum ICE here. ICE is not but border control. Want, they ICE want, doesn't do they that. They don't want to, but they don't want to eliminate, they don't want to get rid of border security in this country. Obviously, immigration laws need to be forced. Democrats believe in that. But they have a different way, they have, they have different ideas of how it should be done. And I think that that's what, you know, sometimes it's easier to say eliminate ICE, but I think that's not a winning strategy. Wow, I don't think that that's eliminate, the, eliminate uh, the federal law enforcement is easier to say than, uh, you know, give me an idea of what they want. David, hit it. Judge, this is why it doesn't matter whether Nancy Pelosi is the Democratic leader or not, as a growing number of Democrats say they won't vote for her for Speaker. You take her out and put somebody else in, you still got a Democrat who wants social, a socialistic uh, health care system, will look to get rid of President Trump's tax cuts, will look to put regulations back on the economy and make workers and job creators have to work under a mother may I system of a, a, an economic system. It's why it doesn't matter matter who the Democrats put in as leader, they're all for the same <laughs> march to socialism that Nancy Pelosi yeah, preaches. But, but wow. David, I'm talking about uh, abolishing ICE. I've got 35 people in Congress who voted to abolish ICE. All right. They want ICE gone. 133 voted present on a resolution to support it and they just didn't vote. I mean, is this winning for the Dems? No, it's not winning well, for look, the Democrats. You know that, Judge. I do, but I'm asking your opinion. That's well, why he gave his opinion. Now you have to give yours. <laughs> well, you know, Judge, if David thinks that he could win on the issues, maybe he should abandon the lazy strategy that they've used for 15 years. He's already got the ads in the can about Nancy Pelosi. Maybe abandon that lazy strategy no, no, that you've no, always no. used the to talk about Chris, the issues, David. The president it's, came it's out actually, and Chris, said... But here's the deal. It's worked. It's worked. Every time Americans have the choice between Nancy Pelosi being speaker or not being speaker, they vote for Republican. You see as much polling well, as I do, and there isn't a congressional district, a competitive congressional district in this country you, where Nancy Pelosi has a positive do approval you know rating. what's going to be hilarious? Dave, you know what's going to be hilarious? If, like, sometime in October... Nancy Pelosi, after you've made all the ads with her face merging with the candidate that you're running the ads against, and, and sometime in October, Nancy Pelosi decides, you know what, this is my last term in Congress. And then you've got to go back to your donors and try to get money for new ads on issues, but you don't have any answers oh, on the issues, which Chris, is why you run those attack ads. You know what, Chris, you're not even answering wait. the question. Here it is. The tr president tweeted, Democrats, don't distance yourself from Nancy. She's wonderful. Her ideas and policies may be bad, but you you should definitely give the woman a fourth chance. She's trying very hard and has every right to take you Democrats down if she's veered too far left. Well, Look. you know what, Mr. President? She did beat you in the budget negotiation last year, and that's probably why David and others are so mad at her. But that's what happened. Are you, you know, mad Chris, at her, David? Chris is... Chris is no. Chris is talking so wacky. He sounds like he's at, uh, trying to be Michael Avante's press person for his presidential campaign. <laughs> Hey, hey, hey. Just because we look alike doesn't mean I support him for president. Yeah, well, well listen, guys, I really think that uh, the abolish ice is really going to work for us. <laughs> all right, Chris, David Avella, Chris Hahn, thanks so much for being with us tonight. And thanks, thank Judge. You. All right, and coming up, Mark Levin takes us on the state of liberalism in America and the mainstream media. Huh. Stay close.
Now for the second part of my interview with radio and TV host Mark Levin, I asked his thoughts on the mainstream media versus Trump and his take on liberalism these days. Take a look. The press claims to represent freedom of the press. The press doesn't represent freedom of the press. Nobody's attacking freedom of the press. They have a First Amendment right. Uh, unlike Obama, the president hasn't sicked the FBI on, on, on uh, individual yeah. reporters or uh, news operations or anything of the kind. Uh, so the press is, uh, is free to be bombastic. And they have many drama queens in the press who really aren't reporters. They are big mouths. They are trying to promote themselves. And you know what they're doing? They're making it more and more difficult for the people to get the news, to get information. And they're making it more and more difficult for this administration and this republic to function. They're not contributing to society in any positive way. I'm not saying they have to agree with the president, but day in and day out to try and sabotage the president and make it impossible for him at times to govern, that is unacceptable. That's not a free press. These are radicals dressed up as reporters who have as their purpose to undermine the president. As for liberalism, well, it's not liberalism anymore. It's statism and progressivism. Mm -hmm. These are radicals. Just listen to their leadership and so forth. You want to impeach a president of the United States the day he's elected? The day he's inaugurated? Mm -hmm. That's not what the impeach impeachment clause says. We know what that's about. The framers discussed it, at the, uh, discussed it at the Constitutional Convention. You don't just get to impeach a president because you disagree with him or you put a bunch of phony arguments together. The left wants to reverse the outcome of the last election. They well, don't like the outcome of the last election. And, and they're disenfranchising everybody who voted to put Donald Trump in the Oval Office. But it, how does this all end, Mark? Well, I'm not sure. But I do know this. If they succeed in impeaching the president, oh. and they won't remove him because he'll never have the votes in the Senate, but just impeaching the president, you're going to have over 60 million Americans who voted for this president who are going to be furious. You cannot have what I've been calling the silent coup take place, where the left has tried to criminalize the election with Mueller, tried to politicize and reverse the election with this imp not the phony impeachment issue. You cannot reverse the votes, disenfranchise over 60 million Americans, and act like it's no big deal and pretend there was a basis for it. So this divide that we have in the nation, and we often have divides in this nation, I do not think it's something that can be fixed very quickly because you are disenfranchising the American people. You're not attempting to remove a president of the United States simply because you disagree with them. That's not America. That's some banana third world republic south of the border. And, 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 and finally, um, when you talk about a revolution, have you ever seen it this bad? The Civil War was bad. I mean, we've had uh, the, the riots in the 1960s was bad. What's different here to me is the institutionalization of the status progressive agenda, which means you cannot, you're not allowed to elect a president from the outside who wants to change what's going on in this country, even if the American people want to change it. Okay. The left felt that they were going to have their third term of Barack Obama. They were 100% sure that Trump couldn't win. He wins, and now they have spent 24-7 trying to destroy him, undermine him. And by the way, destroy and undermine his supporters. They, yes. The media in this country and the Democrat Party in this country are attacking a big faction of the American people day in and day out, calling us Nazis, cultists, racists. You know, it's almost not even aimed at Trump. So many outrageous comments this week, I almost couldn't choose. Take a look at this clip from Michael Moore's new film. How the f did this happen? The American dream is dead. Stop resisting. The president's powers here are beyond question. Ladies and gentlemen, the last president of the United States. Wow. Here with the reaction to that and more, Fox News contributor, former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee. All right, Governor. When I saw that, I, I, it, it caught my, I had, took my breath away. And you? You know, the only, the only thing about that entire little clip that was worth watching was uh, the Jimi Hendrix National <laughs> Anthem. Everything else was typical Michael Moore nonsense. 
the guy has become a joke and he's so melodramatic so full of himself and he can't see the fact that our economy is doing fantastically well we've earned the respect of nations if not their respect their fear America's back on track thanks to the president and Michael Moore is missing it. He's missing a great show out there because he's trying to put his little show together and it has less credibility and it's less entertaining than an old Three Stooges clip. <laughs> I guess you didn't like it. Well, to me, it was it, it was a very, very sad commentary. It's very, it was upsetting to me. It really was. But let's move on. So, <laughs> Rosie O'Donnell, she's always good for an outrageous segment. She claims now that the Trump rallies are filled with paid supporters. Take a listen. First of all, people are paid, Chris. You know that. People were paid since he went down on the escalator. He pays people to show up at right, those Right, but rallies. I don't that know that fact. that's... <laughs> what do you think, Governor? Well, first of all, I didn't know she was back from Canada. Remember, she was going <laughs> to move moving. there if Donald Trump got yeah. elected. Yeah. So I guess she's back. Yeah. Uh, because I assume she kept her promise. Here's the deal. If the people in the Trump rallies are being paid to be there. I've been to a lot of those rallies and I'm telling you they're better actors than she ever was in her entire movie career. So she really ought to stand up and applaud them. That's nonsense. She knows it, but uh, she has a bad, bad, almost terminal uh, case of Trump derangement syndrome. Oh, be careful when you say that. People freak out. They throw you off television shows and out buildings. I know. Anyway, <laughs> all right, Governor, let's move on. Oh. Omarosa. Omarosa has a new book out. Uh, and earlier today, uh, the president called uh, Omarosa uh, in a tweet. He says, um, uh, he, he says, I think he called her a low life. Uh, we have a sot. All right, let's take a listen. <laughs> Low life. She's a low life. Who do you think? Well, I guess their relationship, uh, shall we say, is on the chilly side of, uh, of the street right now. The fact is, uh, she has zero credibility on this. Now, had she resigned and had a press conference in which she said, I just can't stand it anymore, uh, you know, this is not a White House I can work in, that had been different. She got fired. Right. Now, before she got fired, she thought the president was fantastic. After she got fired, and then she got a book contract, not until, but after she got a book contract, she decided he wasn't so cool after all. Why haven't we heard similar things from other people who have left the White House, like Reince Priebus, H.R. McMaster, Sean Spicer? Many people have left, and others have left the cabinet. You don't hear that from them, because... You know, they're not out there to sell a book. They're not out there trying to uh, do something to harm the president. She betrayed his trust. She was either lying before, she was lying now, or she's lying both times. But she has zero credibility. I can't imagine why anybody would buy this book. It makes no sense. And when the title is called Unhinged, I have to think it's an autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Governor Mike Huckabee, always good to have you on. Thanks so much. Thank you, Judge. All right, we'll be right back. Finally tonight, President Trump has his copy. Do you have yours? My new book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, The Case Against the Anti-Trump Conspiracy, is a number one New York Times bestseller. And you can get your copy on Amazon and Barnes and & Nobles. And it answers all your questions. And everything I've been talking about is in the book. Keep up with me throughout the week, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, to find out how to score yourself a signed copy of my book. And you never have to miss justice. If you can't watch, just set your DVR. Thanks for watching. I'm Janine Pirro, advocating for truth, justice, and the American way. Greg Gutfeld is coming up, and I'll see you next Saturday night. Thanks for watching.